sudden sound came up out of the west. Post of plastic walls of hip hop artistry. Spark lyrics to moonlight, dreams to control mics. Words on mixtape rain like holy scripture. Newborn verses rehearsed inside the mirror. Gutter mouth rap born in the habitat of lab rats. Cypher in alleyways, fist pumps received for pay. Man, this is love inside my blood. Combine beats and rhymes, that special brew to nourish you. Culinary craftsmen boil the stew. Prayers to God, bless the meal, sold out the trunk of the car. A taste of my vision, my struggle, my block. Tales of hype and sign, but passion undenied. A cinematic view of a band of brothers bond the crew. If you relate to addicts of the Muzak, we welcome you. to uh, accommodate that or else you might blow some speakers out. I've done it a couple times. <laughs> Classic drums with with just sampling stuff that nobody's ever really sampled before. The sound is really defined drums. You know, hard hitting kicks, slapping snares. The Beirut sound is definitely gritty, but it's, it, it's polished, it's polished too. You know, polished in since that it, we can make the gritty sound good. Artifactual type, you know what I'm saying? Like something archive, something that's, you know what I'm saying, it's got that dusty, rustic, definitely feel to it, but has a, has a refinedness to it. something different, it's raw, man. Like, they find the illest samples ever, and the shit just comes out massive. Man, the sound was always a oh, fucking heavy knock. There was this heavy, heavy knock, like kick and just dirty, just, I mean, like, as, as, just as dangerous as you could make that fucking low end. And then it was these heavy kicks, and it was like, how many fucking pictures can I get to fall off the wall? That's what I'm, that's what I'm going for. You know, exotic, you know, horns and strings and come with some hard drum tracks and bass lines and the way it's put together, it just makes you just want to, you know, bob your head, you know, just, and just get into it and just spit till you black out. I'll let people know who's in the building, you know, stuff like that. It's been called a cerebral sound uh, by other people, but it's thought evoking. They would use symphony samples, orchestra samples, guitar, violin, piano, almost uh, like something you would see in a movie. It is storytelling without words. It is a wall of sound. Uh, when you put on those headphones and you listen to those drums and those samples and those melodies, 
uh, you get swept away. Bump. <laughs> it's bump, nah. But uh, that's that's the main thing. But um, really, it's 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 music. Whenever I think of bigger instrumentals, I think of big drums and obviously a Spanish guitar if you've ever heard our music. It's more than just a beat, it's more than just putting sounds together, it's more than, it's more than that, it, it touches the soul. If you came across a Beirut beat and you were standing up, the point was to get you to move. Beirut was music, Beirut music, Beirut beats, you know what I'm saying, that's what you knew Beirut for. Huge strings, just orchestrated production that was just big and full with, a, with heavy low ends that just they carry over the highs really well. We don't talk much, but we, we express a lot through our music. And that's, that's what we want people to see and hear. Beirut sound is definitely thick, full um, audio, uh, drums and, and bass line. Obviously, is old school. It comes from the days of vinyl and, and cassette tape. At times it almost feels like it's sort of a, uh, a secret society, mysterious, behind the fog, you know, under the curtain type of thing. Beirut Productions is a ministry, not an industry. A brotherhood, you know, I feel like that we're all brothers, you know, and we all came together through the common bond of music. A group of dudes who always used to go play basketball together. Yeah, this is something we, we can connect on outside of the basketball and, you know, say, nightclubs or whatever. What Beirut represents to me and what I always have taken away from it is um, it's always been a safe, creative outlet. We just got strong on a vibe, you know what I mean? And and started putting things together, started putting shows together. We drew our own flyers, you know, we and just creating, creating a scene. It's full of really creative people that can do a lot with a very little. It's definitely been a sort of a culture of uh, understatement, I guess you could say. Um, you know, doing without doing, um, you know, being heard without being known. Creativity would be one of the key pillars to Beirut Productions. Um, another being um, independence. We're part of a culture of underground independent artists whose sole purpose is to inspire others through music. Culture of Beirut Productions. To me, it's a culture, it's a diverse culture. You know, we have individuals from different walks of life, uh, you know, different ethnic backgrounds. We never really try and put a finger on exactly what we are, or what sound we should be, or what we should be labeled as. So, I guess our culture is openness. actually started out uh, writing rhymes, um, which he's pretty good at, and I'm not so. Um, but we were called the Free Agents, and we um, and Damon had produced you know, uh, some of our beats. We met Wooster High School, Reno, Nevada. Um, basically, just on the same page. We just we listened to music. We knew we wanted to. We were all trying to DJ, we were all trying to, we were all mixing, we were all, uh, it was like, it's, it's like Beach Street. Beach Street was a perfect example, you know what I'm saying? Instantly we hopped into the game because um, Jay came over, um, 
brought the uh, Insonic ASR-10. You know, I was fortunate enough to have have a grandma that, you know, had a little little bit of money, you know, after my grandfather passed. So, you know, you know, to ask her for a loan for a thousand dollars, I mean, that that was a big thing. It was it was a really big thing, and very very hard to do, but. Um, yeah, I, I didn't even think she was going to say yeah, but uh, she did. We decided to get into the music, moved up to Seattle. This cat, uh, just, just this guy who just always had beats, always had tapes and beats, and would always bring his equipment over to our apartment. Uh, well, we lived in the same building, so he'd come down to our room. I think he was up in 804. We were down in 606, and he would come down with, you know, he had like this doctor rhythm thing. Um, and he had some beats on there. He'd play some beats for us. Uh, we'd play some of the nasty shit we were making on the ASR-10, and then we would just vibe. It wasn't until uh, Seattle, Washington, where I met Ray Dub, um, attending the Art Institute of Seattle. We were all going to school studying uh, sound design, engineering, mixing, music business. I met them in the, in the dorm, and. Uh, we clicked instantly because we liked the same music. Uh, we made the same music. We were, we were all broke. We had dreams. Uh, we shared the same dreams. That's when the beat sessions began. Those sessions were, were pretty deep and they, and, uh, they consist, consisted of long nights in the studio, making beats uh, till, till the early hours of the morning. A lot of weed smoking. Throughout throughout the uh, months, as we as we got things rolling, we you know we decided to, uh, to bring on a few other cats. I mean, frankly speaking, I think I was probably technically the worst out of everybody, but um, I wasn't really interested in being um, you know head chef there, so to speak. You know, I I, I kind of. Uh, I really didn't want to get involved in that. I kind of wanted to. What I loved about it was I had the stability with everybody else to be like, okay, you could be the crazy guy, you know? The, and that role was accepted. And I really, like, I cherished that role as, like, the wild card. Like, you may get, you know, you may you may get some involvement here with the beat making that everybody's doing, but it, it it's going to be on a wild card basis. You know, I started out in the film business, and there was a lot of bullshit that I saw that I didn't like. And to me, I was wasting my time. And with Beirut, it gives me an avenue to where all my energy goes into that and I'm not wasting my time. There is no filter, there's no bullshit. When I went to Seattle in 2001 and I got a chance to stay um, at a house at the time when a majority of the members of Beirut were all staying in the same house. And this is before I even, even thought about making music. I just liked hip hop music because my brother liked it and I just liked hip hop music because a lot of my friends liked it. I was part of something that I didn't really know I was a part of yet. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and stronger. Once we had our core people in place, uh, uh, everything was pretty much done on a daily basis inside of the studio. We lived in uh, different apartments, uh, different houses. Shit, man. I think we had we were making like no money and we were like fucking living in a Haitian boathouse style apartment situation with fucking six dudes in a two bedroom apartment and never had more fun in my life. And then plus obviously the, the equipment and there's the keyboard, the ASR-10 was always sitting there on. Um, somebody either had a sticker on it saying don't touch it or <laughs> somebody was sitting there touching it, one or the other. <laughs> Something was always jumping off. Yeah, man, the, the ASR-10, that, that's, the, that's a badass tool right there. Love it. We listened to a lot of Wu-Tang Clan and we listened to a lot of Cypress Hill. And the production that was coming out of those camps 
was phenomenal. We wanted to have that sound. So in order to get that sound, you had to get what they were using. So the RZA was using the ASR-10. I had the Woo CD, and I think it was Bring the Ruckus. There, there's a there's a, a break beat in there, and I could catch a little a little piece of it. I was able to figure out how to sample, and and I got that one break, and and started going with that. And I had a couple uh, stock strings on the ASR, and just kind of messing around, put some strings over it, and and somehow got them all playing together at the time because I really didn't know, know too much about sequencing. Anybody else who heard it might, you know, think that was a ridiculous beat, like in, in the negative sense. I, uh, I mean, I thought that was the greatest shit ever. And, I, and at that particular point, I was growing into my own, and, and, and you know, Ray came through. Was like, yeah, man, we we got some stuff. Want you to check it out? It was our first trip back from Seattle, and we came down with some beats on tape. Just I think that sums up the whole style of, you know, my, my, my attack. You know, I'm not a battle rapper, but I consider myself a body snatcher. Raw, he was the original Beirut MC. He just, he was down with us. He told us that he was down with us. That was it. My style, if anything, is, you know, uh, it's right in your face. You know, that's Raw, man. That's R-A-W, you know. Represent the beast within. That's what it is. That's that. It's that internal struggle of man that's coming out to say, "You want? Let's do it." From the depths of raw man walls, journal law, death wish, will a testament is the prerequisite ownership of 45 and nines to get signed and rhyme. Lack of talent, fire your wrong subject matter, falsified shot of having influence to save the music. I take a bullet, cast holding guns, begging in there, nostrils and hell in the shit. Lies can pack the desk for listening, composition written. Although Raw was the first MC. Beirut MC. Uh, dialect was definitely a founder of the overall uh, Beirut productions. Camp and he, and he still rhymes with us and we still work with him. Reno had pretty much no scene, you know, so a lot of cats like us got together, you know, like uh, I think that's how we all linked up because it was really the lack of, you know. Element's always been fond of Beirut beats, Beirut's always been fond of Element music, and at the end of the day, we came up with the same people and came out with the same music. They ended up uh, going to college in Seattle, and then, uh, so we'd go out there, because they, they were the ones with the studio at that point. So we'd go to Beirut to record. I recorded a solo album there. Sure, I think I found something. You bring me good news, I hope. Sources indicate that dialect is making moves with Beirut. What is this Beirut? It's not them you have to worry about. It's dialect. He represents another dimension and has been known to move crowds. Enough! I will hear no more of this nonsense. What should I do? Bring these gentlemen to me. I will deal with them myself. Sacramento hip hop scene. It's uh, it's cool. There's a lot of diverse artists. It's a kind of a close knit community. It's a, it's the kind of thing where it's like um, you have to kind of pay your dues. And you have to put in some time and some effort to get known and to be established out here. Rose. Rose. Now we getting somewhere. Huh. Yes, sir. Back on top of the beat, Cali underground funk in my flow. Heat brought like Sacramento summers. Lefty Rosenthal rose to the beat of a different drama. 
started grabbing heads and, and see who meshed and who didn't. And the ones that didn't got kind of left to the side or, or moved along and did their own thing. But everybody else that snowballed into that ball just kept rolling together, which is obviously great in the musical aspect to, to network like that. Because not all these people are in the same area, let alone in the same city. So The microphone I spit, home base, my brain interface this. Lyrical, spiritual, physical frame, remain a fill beats at times. High period section, flexing the intricate pace. Make moves, bay root, banging them beats, flutter the heart. Through ways of massive collection of skills, collaborate. Put it down for fresh, these whack act black tracks with facts. Making my contact with ear filler raps. I spit it the fitted in fool's heads. Think tanks are days rank for powerful art. Universal make fools, we rip hits, produce Sound bombing a sonic, we pushing after shock for all tools dropping. I'm locking you, popping your joints. Keep up with the style for now. Just play the spectator. Elevate your plow for planting the seed section for growth. Needing crops, dry season for MCs. an ASR-88 in the camp. Um, Benny Blades had it. And uh, can't be mad at him, you know. You got bills to pay, you need to eat, you know. Um, he took it down to a pawn shop and uh, yeah. We haven't seen it since. <laughs> I did get an ASR. I was always intrigued by the ASR after seeing, you know, its capabilities under the hands of the, the Beirut Productions. Now the situation again where it had to go in the pawn shop and unfortunately it left, came and left the family before it really got any good use out of it. For many years um, when, when the Beirut family was all under one roof, yeah, we were starving for sure. Um, you know, getting getting little stamps from the government and stuff to, to feed ourselves. We, you know, we made money where we could, but we definitely starved and worked on a ton of music. One of the better things about them being in a group like that was, you know, not everybody was necessarily broke at the same time, but it also left them to deal with it themselves and bring that money to the table when it was needed. And they had that, that struggle to do that. When we were all broke, it, unfortunately, it was uh, open season at the pawn shop. But then when we were rolling in the money, it was, you know, go find whatever you can at the pawn shop too. Get back what you lost. Money, money is a big influence, uh, but it's not the only thing that drives my music. It certainly helps it pays for uh, the equipment, it pays for promoting, it pays for the websites, and all the advertising. It takes money. I know people who stop because I'm not making any money. What's the point in doing this? You know, and those are the people that weren't really in love with this anyway. Taking money out of your own pocket and paying for your own projects is, oh man, it's draining. Music, if you want to have it as a job, you got to treat it as a job. And Every, if you think about you know, the first job that you had, you may have liked to do one thing, but you hated working in the back in the stock room, or you hated cleaning the floors. Um, you know, all those sorts of things are, are going to move over no matter what job you're doing. Uh, and if you really plan to make a living off of it uh, and replace it with your normal job, there's certain things that you have to do um, that you may not have wanted to do. You know, you got a nine to five, and, and, and necessarily sometimes that nine to five is not what you want to do but it's putting food on the table. I have a doctoral degree in audiology. I have a wife, I have a baby. I try to keep those priorities. What's the, the hardest part is that I know, in some sense, that to get my music out there, I'm really gonna have to take a jump and sacrifice some things and be away from home and maybe cut some hours at work, which may mean less money at home for rent, food, and kids. That's been the toughest part for me is, is deciding you know, when do you, when do you jump and when do you make sure your family's protected and that they're, they're going to eat. Would you be willing to change your entire life if an opportunity came along? Would you give up your job? Would you give up your kids and your girl and give up your family and give up everything for a shot at whatever you think 
you want to be? You have to ask yourself that question. If the answer is yes, then you're probably cut. You're probably cut out for it. You're probably a killer like that. Um, if if the answer is no, or you don't feel comfortable with it, then you know what. You're probably gonna remain where you're at. You know, recently I, I thought if if I was truly truly gonna make it in music, I may have to sacrifice the the benefits of of having that nine to five money right now. And that that's a scary realization. As you get older and like life really starts to take toll on you, you know what I'm saying, you got bills and all that shit, it's a different story. And then I'm not married, I don't got no kids, but if I did, obviously there's certain shit I would have to do to make money to feed my family. This is all I do, so I put my all into this, and I'm trying to get to the point where this is actually my job, you know. It's my job now, but it's not paying the bills. But I want to get to that point where it's paying the bills, and it's kind of hard sometimes. Everybody had their own things to do. Everybody had their own life, but everybody was still, you know, stuck together by that common bond, and it, it never left, no matter what the situation was, down and out, broke, rolling in the money, whatever was going on, it didn't, didn't really matter. It was still about the music. Because some cats, they'll stop doing music. I'm 31. They'll stop doing music at 29, you know? 30 is like the gate. 30 is like the finish line. If you haven't done it by then, it, you're, you're pretty much trying to win the lottery after that point. Once people are confronted with opposition, they'll stop and they'll, they'll turn right around, and go back right where they came from, you know? Or it's just not cut out for some people, and that's fine. Driving to work, I saw a hundred million zombies in their car, late for work, asleep, sipping coffee. Yesterday, looked in the mirror and I saw me in my car, late for work, asleep, sipping coffee. I'm at the edge. My mind's a sledge, hammer that's been pinned up for 29 years. Just want to talk to them. Like put your hands in the air, just want to hum to them and make it all disappear. I see the wheels spinning, I see the time slipping, I see the hunger in them, I see the swagger in them. Yo, these just words, but these will put a dagger in them. If these just words, then how can you get so mad at them? It's like something you never get unless you saw it. It's like that movie where he couldn't get that chain off, and so he sawed it right above his ankle and bled to death trying to run from it from every angle. A piece of me can never run from this. It's 12 something, work in the morning, feeling half awake. Stayed up, making beats, all just for this passion's sake. I missed her while she's awake, all just for this music shit, which if I relied on, couldn't even pay my rent. So I stick to nine to fives and stresses and paychecks, you know, that non-risk that harnesses the talents. I go to sleep next to her and dream about balance when the alarm hits. Plus four, plus two, plus eight. Use that when, 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 I'm, when I do the clap, I do plus eight, and I take, like, see that? I take the middle one off of each one. I'd say uh, the ratio out of the ones I work with is probably 30% of them want to pursue in sports and music. I, I just want me to be out there, you feel me? I, I, I just want people to see me. I don't know, for fame, I guess. The name of this is Ujima Youth Services. I'm actually a case manager here. Most of my cases, actually the age range is from 12 to 18. I would actually, I would guide them to it, but then I would, you know, tell them the downfalls of going into the music business. You know, it's not what it's made up to seem like. When I was in the little gang movement, uh, my homeboys used to rap, but I know how to rap. I guess they taught me. Yeah, I say now these days, uh, it's more kids that you know are influenced by the music because you have, you know, Soldier Boy who actually started off the internet. That appeals to them, and they just want to 
be an entertainer and not so much uh, like a beat craftsman, you know, so to just turn on the computer, make a quick cheesy beat, film yourself shooting, rapping or whatever, putting it on YouTube, I, I just don't feel you've um, really, really done the work. To people who, who are 15 years old and 14 years old right now who don't have any, who have no connection to where it's the 80s, you know what I'm saying, where, the, where we listen to it, they believe that that's hip hop and they don't need any foundation. That's their foundation. Cash, cars, hoes, um, big houses, rims, all that stuff is what young people that can't determine the difference between fantasy and reality, they kind of get get stuck with that image in their head and I think that's what they try and emulate. And besides the typical things like what people hear on the radio, they associate that's all of hip hop music. So whatever's on the radio, whether it be auto-tune or you know, your basic rhymes about females in the club, that's what they think hip hop is. If you want to talk about lean with it, rock with it, or you know, Superman shit, like cool, like that's how they're having fun, so whatever. But you can't always blame the artists. I mean, the A and R's and these record companies are picking these whack ass people. So overall, I can't fault an individual for doing a, a certain thing as far as trying to sell records or what the topics they they talk about. Um, that's on them. That's something they they gotta live with. Everybody wants to make a hit. That's what it is. Everybody's trying to make a hit. Everybody needs to have a hit, and that's what they taught us. And but it. We've known that since day one. We've known we had to have a record out to be popular and famous, but they've changed the game to where this is a hit, and you have to make a hit to be famous, you know what I'm saying? But then you made that hit. That hit can't lead you into that record, because that record don't sound nothing like that hit. You gotta keep making hits now. So that's the problem. It sells more because it's it's being pushed more. Um, it's, it's, it's being put out there to the masses. It's like, here, this is what's hot. Digested. I mean, if you look at the entire landscape of what's popular right now, it's in a very small box. There's a very small message going on out there. That's almost the only side that you really get to see because that's where labels put their money and, and they know what they're doing for sure. They know how to uh, get you to purchase exactly what it is they want you to purchase. There's always your club shit. There's always your, your underground backpack shit. And there's your lyricists, like, and it's, it's always gonna be there. It's created all these class differences in hip hop, and people don't know where it came from, and some people don't even know where they came from, so. I think in order to enter the stage, you gotta know who did what and when before you. We know our history. And that's the main thing I think that's why our music stands out is because we know our history and we know how to take from the past as well as um, pay homage to it. Am I a historic, you know, aficionado? Do I know every intricate detail? No. But, you know, there is, you know, when I, when I, when I do my thing, I, I, I try to pay respect and give credit to the individuals that came before me. Dr. Dre, DJ Muggs. DJ Premier, uh, Pete Rock. Run DMC, uh, uh, Big Daddy Kane was huge. Jay-Z, Nas, Wu-Tang. I'm a, I'm a 90s kid, I grew up in the 90s era of hip hop. The Gold Chain era. Organized Noise. Cypress Hill, Wu-Tang. Rock him, KRS. Redman. Wu-Tang, RZA. Uh, Havoc and Prodigy of Mob Deep. Hank and Shockley, the Bomb Squad for PE. EPMD all day. More than anything else, I think we were kind of weaned on like East Coast hip hop. Even though we were out in the West Coast to begin with, I think we really vibe more with like the shit that was going on back East. I'm going on how it slaps. I'm going to go on how it makes me feel with my chest. You know what I'm saying? So there's many factors in this. This is hip hop music. We gotta feel that music. Oh, you
Blood is you, rain without kicking, flipping your vicious. Music camouflage, the position different, speaks and switches. Walking loud, no fight. You know, we needed a place to record and we couldn't afford $100 an hour. So we kind of started building from scratch our own, our own equipment, our own studios. And like that, like us, those evolved. And, and, and basically, it's just making ourselves, this whole time, we've just been making ourselves self sufficient. Monitors, you can hear, you can hear yourself in the headphones. I can plug in two sets of headphones and basically just go out of the regular studio. This is the dojo. This is my studio. Anywhere we would go, we'd set up shop, uh, set up one room. We'd designate one room as, as the studio. And um, we'd, we'd make as much music as possible. And then if you don't have your own equipment, then you're talking about recording time, mixing time, you know, mastering time, all that stuff adds up. I mean, you can easily, as an independent artist, I mean, I think my last album ran me about $3,000 before it even came out. You know, first off, the money uh, that 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 goes into promoting your own music comes from your job. So not only are you putting time in uh, to make the music and you know spending countless hours, you know, honing your craft and making sure everything sounds right, doing numbers and numbers of retakes and and redrafts of a song or or a verse or what may have you. Not only is that time being spent, but the time that you spend in your job to make money to promote it is. So it's almost like you're you're working the double shift just to do one thing. Um, and that's where, you know, that's where it goes into the, one of the big issues with being independent is that the funding that you're getting, if it's illegal, it's going to take a lot of work to get. And you have to match that with the work with the product and it can get really tiring after a while. When it came time to, to ante up for a project, it was, it was kind of like pulling teeth. Majority of the time. It's coming out of your pocket, so uh, you, you're going to have to make the music, you're going to have to do the artwork, you're going to have to do the footwork, the hustle. I'm all for it, independent all day, you know what I'm saying? But do it to make money and do it to eventually get your independent label or independent status mainstream. You know, that's the key. We want our music to be heard everywhere. That's why they sell records. They say keep that keep that shit at home if you don't want to sell records. Independence is only a, a, a stepping stone to success. When it comes to the advantages and disadvantages of being independent, it's really all perspective. Uh, one person might think it's a good thing to be signed to a label, but uh, you'll end up you may end up uh, stuck within the parameters of what that label wants you to do in terms of how to distribute your music and what you should sound like. It's almost like having a girl with, with a fat ass and big titties, you know, to just talk plain English, you know. She might not be somebody you fully understand and, and want to give yourself to, but the fact that she has those attractive things, you know, you might do some things that, you know, you're not proud of within yourself. So I think you take that metaphor and apply that to young cats coming up, trying to make money, trying to get out of their living conditions, um, wanting to emulate other people. The disadvantages, though, are, are obvious in that if you're an independent artist, uh, the road's not easy. You don't have someone there uh, saying, here's when you're going to do shows. Just give me a copy of your CD and I'm going to put it in all of these stores. The music industry really, I, I, I had an internship for a while and I really got jaded quickly because I, you know, I just, I got a talking to from a guy that, that was working at this label and he's like, cutthroat industry, really hardcore. If you're going to make it, you have to dedicate 100% all of your time to it and there's no guarantees. And I think that really, unfortunately, scared the shit out of me. It's definitely just being able to understand that it's not so romantic. I don't have A&Rs, I don't have publicists, I don't have, you know, all the things that these artists get and they're like spoiled with, I don't have that. So that's an advantage of being on a label, you get a budget and you get people backing you. When I first started, like, I was like, yeah, I'm, 
I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be somebody. I'm gonna be a rap star, this and that. And you, you know, you hook up with all these people, and everybody's hopes and dreams are all the same. So you're like, you, you're vibing. It feels good. You're making music. You're making music. You're doing shows. You're doing shows. And like, after so long of doing that and doing that, you don't see no return, no kickback. It's just, it's fucking, it's hard, man. Like shit hurts. Unfortunately, that's just the way things work when you're an independent artist. You kind of have to do everything yourself. Yeah. Just because people get behind you don't mean they got your back. Beware who you trust and what your dreams and acts. Them so-called friends you know blow like breezes in the wind trying to end what you began. Watch jealousy spin the tangle web they weave when at first they attempt to deceive. They being blinded by greed so take heed of the seed I plant the tree of life whose fruit bring forth the juice of light to decipher. Enemy from best friend, best friend from enemy. Black like the white sheep within the darkness of the family. Deception is the weapon of choice. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Backstabbers with two faces. What are you doing, Jay? Going to sample shopping. Getting some records. Vinyl. We don't digital dig. Yeah, we do. A little bit. <laughs> A little dig is alright. I do that sometimes. Got to now. Yeah. That's the only way you can get some shit. Especially if you're broke. <laughs> <laughs> you're a thief, man. A pirate. Ray has a pretty extensive, or had a pretty extensive collection of records that he would just randomly play in his room on an afternoon, just playing records. Finally looking for something that caught his attention, that sparked up a vibe inside him, and then it would just go from there. I started out DJ and I just love listening to, to music, just love listening to records. Sampling initially started as the, the, the sound of Beirut, and now it's, it's just a, uh, an extra piece of, of uh, almost, oh, it's almost like an instrument that you can just add to your arsenal of tools to create your sound. Well, the stuff that we sample is, it ranges from something you've heard before to something really obscure that no one's ever heard before. Um, it's just how we use it and how we chop it up and how we manipulate it in a way to make it sound. Beirut Productions did it. I think sampling was just, back then was just more, you'd sample something that was way more heard than digging, you know what I'm saying? But once we realized you dig for it and you can find some real rare and some tight stuff and um, cats just started going off. Nowadays, uh, I, I might just put on a record and wait to hear a, a sample that grabs me. Somebody in my generation is gonna say, why do I need to go to the record store and, and pay 100, 200 bucks for that record when I can get the exact same sounding, I can get the exact song, I can apply an effect to make it sound like it was sampled, um, and I can do that all on the internet without paying a dollar. There's only so much music that can be sampled. And the question you know, begs to be answered, what do you do when you don't sample anymore? People are gonna ask for more money to sample music now, and what's that gonna do? It's gonna force people to stop sampling. So it works like a sampler, except that there's no sounds in it. All the sounds are in the computer. Uh, these pads are, are identical to the, uh, the ones on the NPC. Gentlemen, it's a nuclear device. careful too, you can't get lost in the technology, therefore you stop stop your forward progress on, on your music. Because I've got lost in programs before trying to figure out, clicking around how to do something and now I've lost the feel that I was even going for and now I, I scrapped the beat because I'm, I'm done. No, you don't need the best technology, you need talent. I think technology is a great way to advance 
great ideas and to make them sound better and, and, and more ref refined, but I don't think the technology makes the music. Nowadays, if you got a computer, you can do it. Versus back, back in the day, you didn't. You you know you you know computers weren't really there in the in most households. The first, uh, I guess you could say, loop that I made was on a was on a boombox. The way we would try to make a beat is that take a take a tape, and you know the real people know this. You take a tape, double cassette deck, one side. If you want to loop off of that song, you record that piece onto this tape, and right when the loop ends, you pause that tape. You press pause. Well, not, uh, you stop it, then you rewind it, you go back to that point, you pause that tape. So then you go back to the next, you go back to that same loop, play it, unpause it right on the right time, let it play, stop, go back, listen to it, make sure you didn't have a seam in it if you're really about your shit, and then, um, that's how you make your beat. And it was all hissy and stuff because it loses generation. Uh, you know, when you, you know, you record over and over, it just loses all kinds of uh, generations and quality. Um, so it sounds like crap. And now that, that I, I have a better ear and I'm able to use all those, those tools the way I want to, um, my music is a lot more mature, but still holds the same, same raw, dirty aspect. That, that my first beat had. Claiming you're the best over the internet or like you're the dopest MC. For one, MC means, you know, master of ceremony, meaning move the crowd. So if you ain't, you know, you can't claim, really claim that you're an MC if you've never even done one show. You know what I mean? If you're just sitting behind your computer and recording recording joints on your computer or whatever and just posting them, you might you, you might be a dope lyricist and that's cool, but MC you'll never be until you rock the crowd. Nowadays, you know, I think a lot of artists don't even leave their house. They don't, you know, they doing everything from the computer desk. You know, the advent of, of all these social networks and being able to identify yourself as a musician um, on the internet. Uh, the internet is, has created a forum, not just in music, you know, even in just normal walks of life, for you to create, um, you know, an alter ego uh, and, and sort of live, live two separate lives. Uh, and, and I think when, when those two lives conflict each other and they're not in agreement, uh, is where I start to have an issue with it. I wouldn't call myself an MC for a while until I got to a certain to a certain point in my life. But because they got a nice new little uh, Dell from you know fifty nine ninety nine or five hundred ninety nine dollars that they ordered with a nice little processor and got a little graphic little little software on there, uh, now they now they. Uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread, they golden, they have arrived. And I never heard of them, I don't really care about them. There's no room for critique anymore. You can feel yourself into being what you are, you know what I'm saying? And you can't hear if they like you or not. You can never tell because you're not gauging off sales, you know what I'm saying? You're more or less creating a false world because you know they can they can tell you how many plays they got. They can create all that shit now. When something gets played, people are going to know if it's genuine or if it's not. You know, and that's the great thing about social networking is that just as easy as people are able to put up music, it's just as easy for um, another person to turn it off. The biggest unanswered question is where is the money? You know, I think an artist has really a, a large challenge because they need to be self-motivated. Um, they cannot really rely on the music business machine. Like, you know, in other words, you can't just like have a bunch of talent now and be like, people are gonna take care of me, it's all good. You know, people are gonna book my shows and they're gonna fucking get my writer taken care of and they're gonna make sure that I have, you know, uh, you know, 
sleeping accommodations in XYZ city and how I'm gonna get there and all I'm gonna do is smoke weed and fuck bitches and you know drink. But nowadays if you can generate enough buzz uh, on the internet, somebody's gonna come and find you. You basically cut out the middleman. It goes from you know, creation, the creator, to the to the end user. Um, and uh, it, it can't be more simpler than that. You know, you can get on there and put your music on MySpace or get on Twitter and talk to people about it or build your own website and build a fan base on your own. People are getting deals now off of MySpace, you know? And it's, it's crazy that, you know, you can build a buzz about yourself on your own now. You know, you can be your own promotion team. You do it like, you know, your boy Lefty Rose. You go run three miles and you set an agenda and you say, I'm gonna make three beats this week and that's my goal. And you have to be self-motivated. You have to be a self-starter. I think, you know, like we talked about earlier with him, I think he is a, he's a perfect example of the prototypical new artist. Um, less bullshit, running lean and mean, being a self-promotional machine, setting goals, being self-starter, taking care of everything yourself. But I don't think promoting it is the most important thing. I think the most important thing is to have quality. Um, if you're out there and all you do is put up some bullshit, you know, quantity doesn't mean anything. It just means you have a lot of bullshit. Unfortunately, um, the content is not always good. Uh, but they're trying to sell this image um, of something um, that's already been done, you know. Uh, and we don't need to get into what those images are, you know. Uh, but uh, they're really doing a disservice to hip hop and to themselves uh, by uh, creating something that's uh, not really them. Or that dude's feeling himself so hard, he ain't even trying to see you. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, let's network. And he's like, nah, tell me how you feel about my song. And that's when, I'm, that's when the egos come out. And then you're like, well, fuck your song. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> I'm not even, I won't even like it if it's good now. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, if, 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 you, if, you, if you're coming with it, beats-wise, lyrics-wise, no problem, but if you just want to, oh, this sounds cool because I know how to work a computer and I can push a couple of functions, you know, then, you know, that's that's kind of leaves a sour taste in my mouth. You know, anybody can, can start a music profile or upload, even on the iTunes, that's even, people say their music is on iTunes and that's, that's not a difficult thing to do anymore. You know, with the kind of morphing and changing that's going on in the industry because you have so many self-starters and you have so many bedroom musicians that, you know, the music business has been flooded with probably more music than it's ever seen in, a, in, a, in its entire history. And I mean, like, it is growing by leaps and bounds every single day. It's eating up server space as we speak, minute, minute, minute by minute, you know. You have to have some kind of um, web presence, you know, you have to have a, a web hustle. You're not going to make it anywhere um, by just getting your music on the internet. Uh, and hoping and praying that somebody's going to hear it. Some A&R, you know, who really knows what good music sounds like. Um, it's got great musical taste, is going to find you this rough, you know, hidden gem. There's a lot more competition, so you have to be more driven than the next guy. You have to be more interesting. You have to be more everything. I strongly believe uh, that it's about um, hard work meets opportunity. In such a medium, we should be, the artist should be releasing hundred songs a year but I mean there's nothing wrong with you know being able to make music and and put it on right away especially when you know really you really don't have anybody to show it to I mean that might be the best avenue for your stuff to get hurt if you can't if you can't travel as much as you want to travel well your music can travel all around the world on the internet you know so that's where it kind of evens the playing field for an independent artist like myself the playing field is leveled completely um, digital technology has flattened the earth um, you are now not only competing with uh, the dude down the street, you know, at the other end of your block, you're now competing with 50 of those dudes. You're now competing with 50 million of those dudes. I mean, you're competing with all of them because they all have the same technology as you. They all have the same outlet as you. They all have access to the same people. They're all trying to get those people to listen to them.
basically the same struggle that they've been going through from the beginning. It's still continuing to do what it is that they love to do. I guess the struggle is to still get that music out there. I've hit some rough patches in my life where uh, I didn't feel so confident about my art, didn't really know, you know if I had a place in this world. But I think uh, when you love something as much as I do, don't give it up. And then on top of, you know, what I go through myself as an artist, you know, struggling, trying to keep myself motivated doing this, to then have the person that's closest to you doubt you or ask you why, you know, you do this, it wears on you after a while. And I started, I had serious thoughts uh, last summer about, you know, just kind of hanging it up. Not really stopping making music per se, I'll never do that, but just the whole pushing it, doing the shows and all that stuff. But um, I kind of snapped out of that and uh, got my focus back. But yeah, there have been a couple times where I've got to that point, but I just can't quit. Yeah, I did that shit last week, man. I was like, I'm retiring. Yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I'm taking creative energy and, and investing it into um, the music and uh, not getting anything out of it. But I've noticed over time that's that's a huge cycle for me. I'll go through my, my uh, creative times and I'm just making those beats with that, that feel. Um, and, and that's just so inspiring. The feeling of giving it all up is and that's, that's, those are cold days right there. I, I just, I don't think I can ever truly give it up. Even if I haven't made a beat in six months, this equipment's still gonna be sitting here. And every time I walk in the studio, I'm gonna look at it and it, 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 it kinda haunts you at times. It speaks to you, you know? You gotta pursue it. You gotta, you gotta go hard for it. If you want it, you know, nobody's going to accomplish your dream but you. If you want your dream to die, then let it lie there. You know, if you don't want to pick, you know, dust yourself off and pick yourself up and pursue it and try a different avenue, then maybe it's not really a dream. Maybe it's just uh, something that you got a quick itch for. And if uh, if that's the case, slide on. Still flip what God gave me on a balance of being. Hold me down to my last, I put it all on the team. Baby girl back home, hey, you so mean. Five weeks, get your grown, come back on fiend. Relocate for some action, God bless our dreams. And they come in with the fishes, over here with the wings. And them cave, you see them bitches in the dark as they scheme. I've come to that crossroad many times to where I wanted to just hang it up and, you know, do something else. But, uh, I think just being an artist, I could never give up. Life gets hard and it gets tough and it gets difficult and you got highs and you got lows. But if you can if you can look back and remember that feeling that you had when you were with your crew and you were doing what you love to do, take that with you. That's your lunchbox. I don't get to the point where I want to quit. I get frustrated because I know I'm gonna be at this forever, and I know my girl's wondering. I know, you know what I'm saying? I know my kids are wondering. And, you know, they know better than to ask me, but I know they want, you know, it's like, so you, you, you feel that on your shoulders, you feel it definitely. I know I'll never give it all up, but why the fuck isn't it happening? It's tough, I mean, it is tough. You know, you hear like you know, the cliche about the starving artist who doesn't have any money because he's working a job and he's, he really has this artist inside. You know, it's really romantic, but that's just what it, that's realistic, it's what it takes. You know, everybody at some point, uh, you know, was talking about how they didn't have any money and they were doing this and that. You know, even Kanye talks about in his songs, you know, working at The Gap, um, you know, doing five beats a day for three summers. I mean, that's, that's the things that people do and the sacrifices they make. It's a lot more work than people realize to really be good at this and to become what you want to become. What I know is that we got something that we always had. We never lost the essence. We still have it to this very day. So, you know, that's that's the story I want to tell with Beirut is that, you know, don't give up on that tribe. Don't give up on that creative place. Don't give up on that thing where you find solace. As far as where Beirut will go in, uh, in the future, I think um, things are going to progress naturally uh, as they always have been. We've always took our time. Uh, we've never rushed anything. Well, there was never a reason to rush anything because uh, 
this is just something that we're going to do for the rest of our lives. And uh, nothing's going to change that. There's no, uh, there's no era in music that's going to uh, phase us out. It, we really are going to set our own course. If the industry is going to change, then I need to be a disruptor. So I need to somehow find a way into that. I need to get through the fucking bullshit people at the bottom. I need to smash these fuckers in the middle that are just vanilla. I need to go straight for the throat at the top. But I think in the back of your mind, the, your plan the entire time has to be that if you get up to the top and you get to where that cream of the crop at the top is, then your job is to fucking turn it on its head. It's been a struggle to exist Put the name in the mix while working them drum kits Cause is the effect, create when nothing's left Five dollars to eat, a cop this record for a beat There's a choice to be made for the life that you crave Stay up all night and grind to punch the clock like a slave There's a road that you cross from that point no return When the chips are all in like you got money to burn But it's all that you own, meaning that's all that you got Been living on ramen, hoping that something will pop Rip still in the shop, CD set to drop Gotta do it if a couple fans Say they would cop You see there's paper to get So you out on the chase While the rest of them sprint You on a marathon pace Slow and steady's the climb Tapping out is the crime Ambition to get them Wisdom is present to shine Because It's like a journey in compelling narration of life traveling. Tales inspire folks wishing the early grave. Teen dreams, tall cans, and round aprons. Late night street assets, cram sessions, man. Downloads from the block before the internet. Young pop caught the bug watching the older vets. Train cranium to rock stadium. Detour grew old, checking another road. Degree in hand, no can how many albums sold. Slaving. Nine to five, clouded vision, passion for one mic, back on my mission, catch a listen. Hitting gyms if you're dialed in, poetic blissfulness, thank yourself for tuning in. Salvation against viruses, finding kids, movement music, step lively if you're following. Free your mind, regain control of your noggin, man. Refuse tainted goods if it ain't consumable. Embrace life, walk the path, and you're making through. Lift the aim high and enjoy the view. Lord, it's tough when you're living with a dream. trying to like get that emotional storytelling kind of feel you know but then just have this fucking knock just like trying to destroy that soft story you know and so I always felt like there was this middle of the like we had the crust and then there was like shit in the middle and it was like but what what's holding the pie together you know <laughs> oh that's how I always felt because you may be stuck within the parameters and rules of what the label wants you to do. Oh snap! Keep it. We just use the audio. It's all good. Before this interview, I just got on Twitter. Motherfucker. <laughs> Follow what the music does. <laughs> That's my computer, sorry. It says what time it is on the hour. <laughs> well, <I'm at. laughs> but uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Wow, I totally lost that question when I came on. Whoa, dude, you fucking your camouflage right now. Ray, your window's down. Oh shit. Jerk. Sorry, dude. Uh, you don't order chicken at places like that, man. Cause that's just not chicken, that's just pigeon. Motherfucker, that's why you looking like that. Like, fuck, man, I'm trying to get out of here. Shit, they, they just killed my homie guys, dude. They say pollo, but that's just pigeon. <laughs>